Hello everyone and welcome to vlog 1 of skills and capacities in the weight room. My name is Patrick and today we're going to discuss the back squat and the trap bar deadlift. Um, I have chosen two examples, one of a person with a motor control problem and one that is limited due to a lack of capacity. Here we see subject number one performing a weightless squat during his assessment. Um, I'm going to let it play out but already I'm noticing a couple of things while he is performing the squat. So first up we have the direction of his gaze. He is facing downwards. In an article written by Meyer et al. 2014 they talk about that the improper position of the head may negatively impact the position of their spine which we can see in the next picture because the spine angle and the shin angle are totally different from one another. In the next part of the assessment you can see that when he is facing his gaze upwards the spine and shin angle are more in line with one another. The article hypothesizes that athletes have a tendency to move in the direction of their gaze. Here we see the same athlete a couple of weeks later performing the barbell back squat. Um, after working with him a couple of weeks I have cued him on some aspects of the lift and already I'm noticing a lot of improvements during his back squat performance. I'm going to finish playing the clip and then we can determine what kind of differences there are compared to his initial assessment and his current level of performing the back squat. So what I'm noticing immediately is that his gaze is now focused upwards. You also notice that the spine and shin angle are now almost identical to each other. The cue I gave him for this was to keep his gaze up of course and to lead with his chest so that he has to make a proud chest while performing the squat. This ensures that he leads the movement with the head and chest rather than raising the hips when beginning the concentric portion of the squat. Here we see him with a loaded back squat. When adding weight to the back squat what I notice is that instead of simultaneously dropping the hips and knees he starts a movement by moving the knees forwards. Due to the forward movement of the knee at the end part instead of a straight up and down bar path what you see is more like an oval movement so when he goes down he shifts a little bit forward and when he goes back up he has to shift backwards to get to the same starting position. So now we're going to look at the athlete from behind and we're going to discuss what we see. So if we look at the purple line we can see that the bar is placed on the upper traps so the athlete has chosen for a high bar back squat and his hand placement is pretty wide. So moving down from the bar um, I noticed a couple of more things especially around the hips and around the feet. So we're starting off with uh, the angle of the feet. What I noticed is that the right foot is slightly less externally rotated than the left foot. During the movement I could also see that when he squatted down his hips would shift to the left side and his left leg would also be a little more externally rotated compared to the right side. Also it seemed that his feet weren't parallel to one another because it seems that the right foot is a little bit more to the front than the left foot. So now we've just finished looking at example one so we're going to example two the person with the um, limited capacity due to the mobility and uh, injury issues. Um, let's take a look. What we see here is subject number two performing the back squat. What you'll notice is that when he reaches the end of the movement his lumbar spine tends to flex to compensate for the limited motion in his hips or the limited ankle dorsiflexion. So what we're seeing here is that although the gaze is directed forward there's still flexion of the lumbar spine and the shin and spine angle aren't symmetrical to each other. Meyer et al. notes that compensatory movements may increase the risk of injury 
in this case particularly to the spider. So that's what we want to avoid. And now we're going to look from the back side. So the first thing I'm noticing is that subject number 2 chooses a wider stance than subject number 1. According to Damers et al. 2018, a wider stance increases hip flexion and according to Schoenfeld et al. 2010, it decreases the need for dorsiflexion in the ankle. You see that the knees travel towards the toes but at the end fall a little bit inwards, which will be shown a little bit more clearly later on. We can see that the bar is a little bit lower compared to subject 1, so more um, aligned with the top of the scapula, so this is more like a low bar back squat. And also compared to subject number 1, the feet are more in a symmetrical position, so both feet are almost equally rotated outwards and the ankles are in line with one another. And also we don't see a hip shift to the left. Um, the difference between a high bar and a low bar back squat is that the high bar back squat is more knee dominant and the low bar back squat is more hip dominant. This is shown by a greater forward lean trunk and a reduced knee flexion angle, as described by Glassbrook et al. 2017. When reaching the end range of the squat, I mentioned before, you can see that the right leg internally rotates and you have Falco's moment of impact. Now we're going back to the lateral view, but this time with weight shoes. And now you can see an immediate improvement of the posture. The athlete is with the shoes is now able to keep a symmetrical position of the spine and shin angle. Although there is still a little bit of flexion happening at the end. Also you can see that he hasn't hit full depth yet. Because what you'll see is that the hip crease is still above the knees. What you'll see in a moment is that when he tries to go further down, he automatically has to flex his lumbar spine a little bit more to compensate for the lack of mobility in either his ankles or his hips. While looking from the backside with the shoes, there aren't that many obvious differences compared to no shoes. Now we go back to athlete number one performing a trap bar deadlift. I'm just going to let the clip play out and then we'll discuss what we see. What we see here is that the athlete is facing downwards with a large flexion in his lower spine and his thoracic spine and that when he pulls the weight up, he pulls from his back instead of using leg drive and pushing the hips forward in the second part of the movement. The cues I gave him to improve this is to keep the gaze forward, keep a proud chest and leg press the weight off the floor. You can see that his spine is in a lot more neutral position compared to before. The second rep was a little bit worse, but after that he starts to get the gist of it, but sometimes um, you'll see that he has a little bit of a problem controlling the weight on the way down and therefore loses position so when he tries to get up he has to pull from a somewhat less optimal position so to speak. Here we see athlete number 2 performing the trap bar deadlift and immediately you notice some differences compared to athlete number 1. So in both cases, the gaze is directed forwards and the lumbar spine is in a neutral position. You can also see athlete number two bracing every time he lifts the weights and at the end of the movement push the weight out through his mouth. The hips and knees rise in one fluent movement. When comparing motor control issues with capacity issues, you can see that with motor control a lot can be fixed by cueing and with capacity issues it's more adjusting by using accessories or using exercises for for example hip or ankle mobility to improve the squat. So now we've reached the end of this uh, skills and capacities vlog. I hope it was helpful and uh, I will see you next time.